for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Who's that, Bishop, Johnny? Oh, hold on, Mr. Bishop. Are you employed? No, not right now. Good. The company insures a Lieutenant Nathan Hale, New York Police. He was killed yesterday. Oh, yeah, I read about it. Shot in his garage. See what you can find out. Who's handling the case? Sergeant Kemper, 15th Precinct. He was Gale's partner. <laughs> taking a minute or so to talk about seals and fish that have some connection with the government of the United States. Now, that isn't as strange as it sounds. You take the matter of seals, for example. There are two types of seals that are the responsibility of the Secretary of State. First, there's the Great Seal of the United States, which is stamped on all official documents. The Secretary of State makes sure it's always on hand when it's needed. The other kind of seals he takes care of are the ones that swim in the ocean, since it's up to the secretary to work out agreements with representatives of other countries and let them know how many seals can be caught in what is called international waters and when. The secretary of state works out similar deals for the catching of fish and lobsters because these agreements are actually treaties. Before they can be put into effect, they have to be approved by two-thirds of the Senate. As a matter of fact, any time our government wants to work out a deal with a foreign country on trade, mutual assistance, fish, seals, or lobsters, it's done by treaty. And all treaties are signed by the president, though some of them aren't drawn up until after the Secretary of State has worked over the rough spots in order to pave the way for prompt ratification. So... Just remember, the Secretary of State is a mighty important wheel in the machinery of your United States government. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nathan Gale matter. Expense account item one, $23.55. Train fare and incidentals from Hartford to New York City. Expense account item two, 75 cents. Cab fare to the hotel. I registered and put in a call to Sergeant William Kemper at the 15th Precinct Police Station. Kemper said I could stop down anytime. So in 20 minutes, I was sitting in the homicide squad room listening to Sergeant Kemper's version of the killing of a fellow police officer. Nate had been after a hood named Bancroft for a long time. Word was out that Bancroft had finally gotten a little tired of it and was going to hit Nate the first chance he got. You think Bancroft killed him? Yeah, but so far we can't prove it. The day Nate was killed, he called in and told me he was onto something hot. Said it concerned Bancroft. Told me to meet him at his house in an hour. Said he was contacting a stoolie named Virgil Cummins. All right. Hello, Dave. Anything for me? I don't think so. You have any idea what he was supposed to get from this Virgil Cummins? No, he didn't say just what it was, but he indicated it was a big score. Enough to fry Bancroft for keeps. I went to his house in an hour, like he'd asked, and I found him in the garage, shot twice. No witnesses? Yeah, a neighbor, George Fisher, said he saw a man running away. We brought him down here and showed him the mugs. He picked out Bancroft. Well, then... We picked Bancroft up, put him in the lineup, and the witness changed his mind. Said Bancroft wasn't the man, after all. Somebody got to him, huh? Of course. But the witness won't change his story again. He insists that Bancroft's not the man he saw running away, and that's that. He's scared stiff. He's got a wife and four kids. Has Bancroft got an alibi? Says he was with his girl at the time of the killing. And his girl agrees? A hundred percent. We've questioned them both for hours. What about the stoolie? Coming. I went looking for him right away. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. If they'd come in, tell them I'm down in Basker's office. Oh, yeah. So we found Cummins, all right. Found him in his room, strangled by a light cord. Whoever shot Gale got the evidence. Sure. So it's got to be Bancroft. But without the stoolie, we can't prove there was any evidence. And Bancroft's girl swears Bancroft was with her the whole afternoon. And your only witness won't identify Bancroft. That's the way it stands so far. But I'm working on that witness. I'm going to keep working on him until he admits Bancroft's the man. Well, I've got to go talk to Gail's widow. Oh, Ab's taking it pretty good. She's a wonderful person. You'll like her. I'm sure I will. Well, so long, Sergeant. I'll keep in touch with you. Expense 
expense account item three. A dollar and seventy-five cents cab fare to the Gale home. I introduced myself to Mrs. Evelyn Gale, the dead officer's widow. She showed me into a small, attractively furnished house where I met her two children, Greg, five, and Mike, three and a half. She told the boys to go out in the tiny backyard and play until we were finished talking. Stacy thinks her father's gone away on a trip. They're too young now to really understand. Greg would understand in a way, but it'll be too hard on him. When they get older, they won't miss their father so much. It'll be easier to tell them. Yeah. You said you talked to Bill Kemp? Yes, I just left him about half an hour ago. He and Nate were partners for a long time. I think Nate's death hurt Bill just about as much as he did me. But you want to talk about insurance, don't you? Just a few questions and I'll get out of here. Of course. Tell me a little something about the day your husband was killed. Well, there was nothing particularly unusual about it. It was like most any day, except that it was our anniversary. He didn't say anything or tell you anything that was unusual? I don't think so. I wouldn't remember it if he had. Did he call you during the day? No. What time did you expect him home? He was off duty at 6. He had the day watch. He was usually home around 6.30. Were you here in the house when he drove into the garage? No. I was down at the corner, the grocery store. When I got back, Bill was waiting for me. I saw the other officers around the garage, and then the ambulance pulled up. Where were the children? With their grandmother, Nate's mother. I left them with her around four that afternoon. Nate and I were going to have dinner and go to a show. Celebrate the anniversary. It was our seventh. Do you know George Fisher? Yes, he lives across the street in the White House. I've spoken with him since... He's avoided me, but I saw him this morning backing out his car, and I went over and talked to him. He says he saw the killer. But he told the police he saw a man running away from our garage right after the shot. He made an identification. Yes, I know about it. Bill Kemper told me he changed the story. Yes. Do you think he can really identify the killer? Well, I think so, but he's, he's so frightened. Oh, I don't blame him. He has a family, and he wants to protect them. What did you say to him? Well, I told him that I understood, but that he should make an identification if he could... I told him that protecting a killer isn't the way to protect your family. But he wouldn't listen. No. And I... I really wonder what I'd do in his position. George has a lovely wife and four adorable children. I don't know. Well, I think I'll have a talk with Fisher. I doubt if you can do any good. Bill's worked on him and worked on him. The whole department's trying to get an identification or a statement. Well, I'll have a shot at it anyway. Thank you, Mrs. Gale. I went across the street to the Fisher house and spoke with his wife. She told me her husband was still at work, wasn't expected home until 6.30. She refused to tell me where her husband worked, stating they'd been bothered entirely too much since the Gale killing. It was obvious she also was frightened. Very frightened. Expense account item four, a dollar and a quarter. Cab fare back to my hotel, where I put in a call to Sergeant Bill Kemper to ask where George Fisher worked. Kemper was out, so I left my number and went downstairs to have some lunch. Around 1.30, I was paged and told that Kemper was waiting for me in the lobby. Hello, John. Oh, hi. You got my call? Yeah. Let's go over and sit down where we can talk. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I called to find out where George Fisher works. He doesn't work anywhere anymore. What do you mean? He was killed about an hour ago. Let's sit down. Hmm? Murdered? Hit and run. On his way to lunch with two men from his office. They were crossing the street and a car hit them. All of them? Killed Fisher, hurt both of the men, went pretty seriously. Any witnesses? Yes. Yeah. Got a positive identification on the car, got the license number. Even found the car. But not the driver? No. Found the car parked in the east side of town. It had been reported stolen at 8 o'clock this morning. Bancroft? First thing I checked on. Yes. He was with his girl all afternoon. What about 8 o'clock this morning? Claims he was sound asleep in bed. And was he? And we checked his hotel. Nobody can swear he wasn't. He left a call for 11. Nobody saw him leave the hotel before then. A number of people saw him come in last night. Well, maybe he didn't do it. And maybe he didn't. But it sure seems funny. The one man who could identify Bancroft as the man seen running away from Nate's garage who'd get killed a couple of days later. Did you find anything in the car? There's a lab's checking on the car now. Did the witnesses say whether a man was driving it or not? Yeah, they said it was a man. Couldn't see him well enough for identification. Wore a hat. 
Well, maybe he had somebody steal the car for him, left the hotel at 11, took the car, and went after Fisher. Looks like the only possibility. Could his girl have stolen it? No, no. She was in her apartment, definitely. And Bancroft was with her from 11 until when? A little while ago. That's where we picked him up. This clerk swears Bancroft came in a little after 11. and didn't see him go out. Did he have to pass the desk clerk to go out? If he took the stairs, if he took the elevator, one of the elevator boys would have seen him. None of them did. Well, you got a tough one. That's why I wanted to talk to you. I know Bancroft killed Nate. Maybe he didn't run down Fisher, but I'll bet he had something to do with it. Now, the strongest and the weakest link is his girlfriend. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, just before we got the report on Fisher's death, another call came in. It was from a jeweler. The day Nate was killed was his seventh anniversary. Yeah, Mrs. Gale told me. Well, the jeweler told me that Nate had been in looking at watches. He told me Nate couldn't make up his mind between two of them, so the jeweler told him to take them home and let Eve decide. He took them. Was this before or after he made the contact with the stewie? Before. He must have had them with him when he saw it coming. Did he have them with him when you found him in his garage? No. So it looks like the killer took them. I remember the glove compartment was open. Nate probably had him in there. The killer got the evidence and looked in the glove compartment to make sure he didn't miss anything. Saw the watches, took them along. You think Bancroft might have given them to his girl? He might. Or he might have pawned them. I got out the usual bulletins to all the pawn shops and we were checking every fence we know of. They were uh, fairly expensive watches. In the description. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you just get a warrant and search the girl's apartment? I thought about it, but if Bancroft gave her one or both of the watches, he's smart enough to tell her not to wear them or have them around. You find the watches, deep in one watch, and connect them to Bancroft to Betty Hall. That's the girlfriend? Yeah. Johnny, you think you could find out if she's got one of those watches? Me? Well, how would I do that? Get close enough to her. Oh, you won't mind. She's a darn attractive dame, if you like the type. Well, I guess I could try. But what about Bancroft? I'll get him out of the way. But I can't keep him forever. You'll have to impress her in a hurry. Well, maybe she doesn't want to be impressed. She likes men with money. Lots of money. Sergeant, I hate to tell you uh, this, You but... just put up a good front. We'll figure a way for you to meet her, and we'll make sure she knows you're loaded. Okay, but if someone gets careless and asks me to change four bits, the whole plan goes right out the window. With your permission, there's something I'd like to talk about for a minute. You know, too many times people try to escape from their responsibilities by having someone else take them over. There was Miles Standish, for example. He was much too busy to ask Priscilla to marry him, so he sent John Alden to pop the question for him. You know what happened. John ended up marrying the girl himself. Of course, if John had had a face like a flat tire instead of being the handsome guy he was, maybe Miles Standish would have married Priscilla instead. Well, actually, I don't know what got me started on this subject, and unless it was my thinking about people who represent somebody else, Take our State Department, for example. Being a representative is one of its biggest jobs. Through the Foreign Service, it helps the Justice and Treasury Departments handle immigration, narcotic, and quarantine problems. And the Secretaries of Agriculture and Commerce look to the Secretary of State to help keep their fingers on the pulse of foreign markets so they can keep the business firms and farmers of America informed on matters of import and export. I guess the only connection between these facts and the courtship of Miles Standish is that, like John Alden, our State Department speaks for itself. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Kemper made arrangements for me to move into another hotel where Johnny Dollar, the insurance man, would be known as Johnny Dollar, the Texas oil man. Kemper got me a fancy pair of boots and a 10-gallon step. I was all ready to turn the lovely Betty's head. The men who were tailing her reported to Kemper that she was shopping at Meshikoff's Fur Salon on Fifth Avenue. Kemper immediately put out a call to pick up her boyfriend 
Then Kemper and I left for the Fifth Avenue shop. When we got there, Kemper pointed out the quarry, and I went to work. She was trying on a mink stole when I walked up to the sales lady. Oh, it's just lovely. Yummy. Yes, that's one of our nicer stalls. It's ranch mink, isn't it? Yes, but if you prefer... Oh, well, no, I'm just looking, but I'll probably be in next week and buy something. Certainly. <coughs> oh, yes, sir. Can I help you? Well, yeah, I thought I'd like to buy a fur coat or something like that. Would you excuse me? Oh, sure, go right ahead. I'll just look around. Oh, now, I didn't mean to bust up nothing. Well, that's all right. The lady's just looking. Well, okay. You sure you don't mind? Not a bit. Uh, sir, what kind of fur coat would you like? Well, I'd like something real nice. I'm just in New York for a couple of days. I'd like to bring my mama back a little present. You're from Texas? Why, yes, ma'am. How'd you know? Well, I, I can always tell Texas man. So tall and strong. Oh. <laughs> Would you like something in mink? Yeah. I'd like to mink, too. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm having just a wonderful time here in New York. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. First vacation I had since 43. Just been too busy with the whales. That oil well? You don't buy mink coats with water, lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about this lovely stall the young lady was just trying on? Well, uh, no, ma'am. It's uh, too skimpy. I want something can keep Mama warm. She ain't spry like she used to be. Can't take the winters too good no more. Something that hangs down to the floor. You know, coat. Yes, sir. Well, if you excuse me, I bring out a few that you can look at. Fine, fine. You just take your time. Do 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 do. Uh, pardon me. Uh, for what? Well, I couldn't help but over here. Oh, that's all right. I ain't gonna buy this one, ma'am. You can have it. Oh no, no. I I just thought maybe I could help you a little. I do a lot of buying here, and I know you're from out of town. Texas. Uh, yes. And well, if you're going to buy a mink coat for your wife. Uh, for my mama. I ain't married, ma'am. Oh. Well, have you ever bought a mink coat before? Why no, ma'am. Only mink I own is in my car back home. In your car? Yes, ma'am. Mama thought it'd be nice to upholster it that way. In mink? Oh, I know it ain't practical, but Mama thought it looked nice. It does, too. Goes right nice with the gold. The gold? Yeah, you know, the door handles, cigarette lighter, a lot of little things like that. Uh, oh, yes. Well, what kind of car is it? Well, it's a sort of a double-length Cadillac. Had a built special. Oh, how nice. Yes, it's nice. Well, uh, the only reason I came over was because I thought as long as you were from out of town... Uh, Texas. Uh, Texas. Yes, well, I thought maybe you'd like someone to help you pick out the right thing. Well, now, I think that's right thoughty of you, ma'am. But I don't want to put you into no trouble. Oh, it's no trouble. Oh, good. Uh, my name is Dollar. My name's Holmes. Betty Holmes. Well, howdy. You can just call me Johnny. That's my front name. All right, Johnny. Oh, here comes the sales lady. <laughs> We looked at Mink for the next hour, and Betty Holmes offered her most discriminating advice. Before we left, I'd ordered Mama two mink coats, one for just setting and one for going out. On the street, I thanked Betty for her help, and naturally, she accepted my dinner invitation on the spot. Expense account item five, a dollar and 40 cents cab fare back to my hotel, where I waited until Bill Kemper showed up. <laughs> Pretty funny, huh? I couldn't hear what was going on, but... I had to stay out of sight because she knows me, but... Boy, you were really pretty awful. Yeah, I know, but she loved it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have dinner with her. Uh, good. What about Bancroft? Now, we got him. We'll keep questioning him. If his lawyer gets a writ, we'll move him to another precinct. How long can you keep that up? Long enough for you to have dinner and get better acquainted. I hate to pick her up in a cab. Uh, don't worry about it. What time's your date? Eight o'clock. I'll have you a limousine, complete with chauffeur. Officer Dankers. We'll get one of the cars we use for the parades and VIP. Boy, if this backfires, they'll hear the explosion clear up in Maine. The long black limousine was waiting in front, complete with Officer Danker, dressed as my chauffeur. We picked the lovely Betty Holmes up at 8 and drove to 21, where I ran up expense account item 6, $45.95. Drinks, dinner, and a pack of cigarettes. When she suggested going to some of the night spots, I felt you in the home office cringe. 
So I complained of fatigue. I told her I'd been working so hard in the oil fields that the Mayo Clinic had advised me to stay away from too much nightlife. She gave me a motherly, knowing smile and suggested we return to her apartment where she'd fix me a glass of warm milk. She was very understanding. Here you are, Johnny. Not too hot, not too cold. Better for your stomach that way. Well, you're a pretty wonderful person. Mind if I sit down? Oh, please do. You know, I never met any girls like you before. Now, when I told you I couldn't go to any of them there clubs, why, you didn't mind one bit. I understand. Oh, Mama sure would like you. The last thing she said before I left was, Johnny boy, you watch out there in that big city. Watch out for girls like me? Oh, no, not like you. You see, Mama thinks every girl is just out after my money. There are some nice girls left in the world, Johnny. Why, sure. And you're one of them. Well, you've got a nice place to live, nice clothes. I guess you've got everything you want. Yes, I guess I've got just about everything a girl would want, but I've never met the right man. Someone I could really settle down with, make a good home. Oh, that's too bad. I guess it ain't easy living in a big city like this. No. But someday I'd like to get back to the farm. The farm? Yes, I was raised on a farm. That's the life. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Oh, the cows and the chickens. Well, we ain't got them no more. Just a lot of oil wells. But it's still a farm. Well, more like a refinery with beds. But it's out in the wide open spaces. Yeah, but all you can see is them blasted oil wells. Oh, it's a rugged life, full of the great outdoors, the smell of the sagebrush. No, just oil. But you love it. Yeah. But see, what time is it? I must have left my watch in my suite. Oh, well, I don't have a watch. There's a clock in the kitchen. You ain't got a watch? No, why? Well, I'm in luck. I sure am. What? Well, you've been so nice to me. Help me pick out those coats for Mama. I've been trying to think of something I could buy for you. Oh, now, Johnny. No, I want to. I've seen the things you're wearing tonight. You've got that nice mink and all that there jewelry. But you ain't got no watch. Oh, please, I really don't. No, when I want to do something, ain't no use trying to talk me out of it. I'm going out tomorrow morning and buy you one fine watch. Oh, that's really wonderful. Oh, it ain't nothing. Johnny. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, well, I don't really mind. Kind of like it. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, about the watch. Uh, where, where's a good place to get a nice watch? Well, there's... No. Wait a minute. Johnny, would you like a really nice watch? I don't mean it's too expensive. Oh, I don't care about that. Can't pay too much for a watch. How much would you want to pay? Well, I want to get you something real nice. Well, I know a friend. He's in the jewelry business. He's got several beautiful watches. I know him very well. And he'll sell them wholesale. Well, you're really pretty wonderful. Mm -hmm. Always thinking of me. I could send him over to your hotel. Well, why don't you just do that? All right, I'll call him and I'll have him stop by tomorrow. Good. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to ask you a little favor. Yes, Johnny? Could I? <clears throat> yes? Well, could I? Yes, Johnny? Could I have some more milk? When I got back to my hotel, Bill Kemper was waiting for me in my room. I told him everything that had happened. Kemper put in a call to the precinct and ordered Bancroft's release. Then he said goodnight, and I turned in. The next morning, Kemper was knocking at my door, and we settled down with breakfast to wait for Bancroft to arrive with the watches. Yeah, it's good coffee, Johnny. Yeah, it is. Hey, maybe this is it. Hello? Johnny? Well, good morning. I didn't Oh, no, I've been up since six. Can't get out of the habit. Oh, good. Well, the reason I called, Johnny, the man who was going to bring the watches by... Yeah? Well, he can't. Oh, that's too bad. But he gave them to me. I can bring them by if you want. It was a sure bet Bancroft was playing it safe. He wanted to unload the dangerous watches, 
but he didn't want to be the one to do it. We cleared the table of Kemper's breakfast dishes, and a half hour later, Betty Holmes was announced from the lobby. Bill Kemper went in the bedroom to wait. Well, good morning again. Good morning, Johnny. You sure do look nice. Come on over and sit down and have some coffee. Oh, I'd love some coffee. I didn't particularly want to bring the watches myself, but my friend was busy. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. He gave me the prices and everything. Well, let's see him. All right. Oh, they're right pretty. Mm -hmm. Now, this one, you want 700. Mm-hmm. And how much for this one? He said that one wasn't as expensive, only 500. That's, uh... Wholesale, hmm? Oh, yes. He said they're very unusual watches. Yeah. What's the matter, Johnny? Something wrong? Yeah. Bill? Well, what is it? What's going on? Hello, Betty. What is all this? Don't you know? These are the watches, Bill. No, I thought they'd Why, be. you crummy, no-good, rotten freak. Just take it easy. You're a cop. No, not quite. You can't get away with it. You don't have anything on me. Give me those watches. Oh, wait a minute. Who gave you these watches? You can't pinch me. You haven't got anything. I got all I need. I got the watches that were taken out of Nathan Gale's glove compartment right after he was murdered. I don't know anything about it. The guy just gave me the watches. Who? Bancroft? Oh, okay. Then you're going to take the rap. I don't know anything about it. You know I didn't have anything to do with Gale's death. You know I was in my apartment. These watches are all I need. They'll send you right up. No. Then tell me who killed Gale. Bancroft. How did he get out of your apartment without anyone seeing him? The service elevator. But I didn't have anything to do with it. Did he kill Fisher? Yes, yes. He was afraid Fisher would talk. Who stole the car? Who stole it? I did, but he killed Fisher. He killed Gail and Fisher, and I didn't have anything to do with it. You had enough to do with it to get your life. Come on. I'm going to book you and then get me a cop killer. See you later, Johnny. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks. You all... Expense account item seven, one hundred and thirty-five dollars, hotel bills. Item eight, twenty-five dollars and thirty-five cents, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, two hundred and thirty-five dollars even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs>